the things I, I love to do is uh, take my family out to dinner. And when we do that, uh, a treat is getting dessert. And I'm not talking about any kind of dessert where everybody gets their own dessert. No, I'm talking about a dessert that's warmed in the oven for about six to seven minutes. It comes in a pizza-like dish. It's a chocolate chip cookie with vanilla ice cream on top where the chocolate chips are warm. They're, they're melting. The ice cream is soaking in. What's it called? Pazuki, right? I believe there will be pazuki in heaven. And here's what happens at our table when we eat as a family. Everybody gets a fork. That pazuki comes, and everybody just kind of leans in. You grab your fork. You get a little bit of that ice cream on there, a little bit of that cookie, and mmm, 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 party in your mouth, right? It is just absolutely amazing because there's something for everyone. Here's why I say that. Today we're looking at one of the most powerful chapters in, I believe, all of the Bible. And there's so much to this passage that I want to encourage you to lean in because there is something for everyone. And so if you have your Bibles, meet me in John chapter 11. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. If you don't own a Bible, this is our gift to you. John chapter 11 is where we're going to be hanging out. We're in this series titled More Jesus because when we experience more Jesus in our lives, our lives are always better. It doesn't mean that they're always going to be easier, but with Jesus, life is always better. And we're looking at the miracles, and we're looking at the parables, and today what we're looking at is one of the greatest miracles where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And we're not going to be able to look at all of these verses in chapter 44, but there's four different scenes that we're going to be be looking at number one is with Jesus and the disciples. Scene two is with Jesus and Martha. Scene three Jesus and Mary, and scene four, Jesus is with Lazarus and all the people. And so, John chapter 11, starting in verse 1, this is how the Gospel of John wrote this. It says in verse 11, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. So let me just pause there just for a moment. One of the hardest things to realize is that in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our grief... God is often working for our good, but ultimately his glory. And then chapter 11, verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Let me just stop there just for a moment. This is, this is John writing. One of the things that John referred to himself as is the disciple whom Jesus loved. We see that throughout the gospel of John. Hey, the disciple whom Jesus loved. In other words, holler at your boy, Jesus loves me, right? <laughs> And so John wants it to be clear that, that Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, who was ill. And then it says this. So, in verse 6, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Say what? That doesn't make sense. Here, here. Somebody that Jesus loves, one of his close friends, Lazarus, is ill. Instead of going towards him, he stays where he's at. Why? Because there's some things that God does that doesn't make sense. There are some things that God is doing in your life that doesn't make sense. You don't understand it. You can't comprehend it. And in the midst of the unknown, what do we focus on? We focus on what we know, that God loves you. That Jesus loves you. You may be thinking, I don't even know who Jesus is. I don't even like Jesus. I don't love Jesus. That doesn't change anything. Jesus loves you. And how do we know that? Because he died for you. 
says in the scriptures that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So here in the beginning of this passage, we see that Jesus is up to something. We don't know, but he loves these friends in the midst of this crazy situation. And then verse 14, this is what it says. It says, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. So a little bit of time has passed. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Don't miss that. So that you may believe. Uh, here, this delay is not an accident. It's, it's an arrangement because this is what it says in verse 17. Verse 17, it says, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead uh, and in the tomb for four days. So, so Jesus, again, has this arrangement, this plan. Well, why four days? Because in this culture, if somebody had been uh, sick for a couple days, appeared to be dead for a couple days, at times they would actually heal and become better. People thought that they were dead, but they were actually just really sick. Jesus didn't want there to be any confusion that Lazarus was fully dead. That's one of the reasons why Jesus was dead not one day, not two days, but three days. So there could be no confusion about the fact that Jesus Christ really died. Now, what happened on the fourth day? The fourth day, according to the culture, your, your, your body would literally start to deteriorate. There's the understanding that your soul would leave your body. And so there was zero question in the eyes of the people that, that Lazarus truly was dead. But this, again, is not an accident. It's an arrangement. And then in verse 18, it says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Verse 21. Mary said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. One of the hardest things in life is being patient. It's waiting. How many of you struggle with patience? Raise your hand. Some of you are like, ah, me. You couldn't even wait to raise your hand. That was kind of weird. How many of you are sitting next to somebody that struggles with patience? Raise your hand. Oh, a few more hands went up that time, huh? Uh, my, my, uh, my daughter, Hallie, is 14 years old, and she struggles with patience. And where she struggles with patience the most is when we're in the vehicle and she's in the front seat. When that light turns green and the car does not go in front of us, she's the first person to say, go, 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 go. Dad, honk your horn. There's been times where she's leaned over to honk the horn herself. I'm like, sweetie, you, you can't do that. I'm concerned when Holly gets her driver's license, she's, she, the light's going to turn green. She's just going to lay on that horn. And if the person does not go in front of her, she would slowly pull up the vehicle to hit the front bump, the back bumper of theirs and start pushing that car through the intersection. She lacks patience. For me, I try to be patient. I try not to honk. I'll like, light turns green. I'll like, wait a second, one, one thousand, two, one thousand. Three one thousand, they'll do a little honk, and usually what happens is the car will finally realize that the light is green. They'll go through, it turns yellow, and I'm stuck at a red light again. <laughs> but the hardest season of waiting is when you're in pain and there's nothing you can do about it. When God's your only hope. Some of you have been there, you've been in the waiting room. You're in the waiting room right now. You're waiting for God to do what only God can do. And what does Martha do? She says to God, God, Jesus, God in the flesh, if, you, if you'd been, if you'd been there, if you'd been here, my, my brother wouldn't have died. And she puts God in a box. She puts Jesus in a box. Why? Because Jesus has the same power in the hospital room that he does the cemetery. Jesus can do all things. See, Martha thinks that time and space are important to Jesus. Jesus didn't need to be there to heal Lazarus. Uh, time was not an obstacle to Jesus, and we're going to see that in just a moment. But she limits Jesus on so many different factors, space, geography, time, which never limit the power of God. 
And it's interesting, uh, when somebody would die in this culture, what the women would do, they'd go back to the house and for 30 days they would mourn, they would cry. They would weep. And so Jesus meets Martha exactly where she is, is weeping, crying. And then in verse 22, it says this. It says, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I love this because in this moment, Martha goes from how she feels to what she knows. She's like, my feelings aside, my frustrations aside, Jesus, I know you can do all things. I know you have the power to do all things. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And then Jesus is going to respond with a couple of the most powerful verses in the entire New Testament. Jesus says this in John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What's he saying to Martha? He's saying, Martha believed in the resurrection as an event. Jesus is saying, no, Martha, resurrection life, it's, it's in a person. Martha's knowledge of eternal life was an abstract idea. And Jesus is saying, no, resurrection life is a personal relationship. Martha thought victory over death was a future expectation. And Jesus is saying, no, it's a present reality. In other words, Jesus is saying, what, are you, what you are talking about, you're talking to. And what you are looking to, you are looking at. See, don't miss this. Jesus, in saying this statement, is saying, I'm God in the flesh. Martha, I can do What only God can do, I can provide resurrection, I can provide life. And not only that, I am resurrection and I am life. It's only found in me. And this is one of seven I am statements that we see in the Gospel of John. Jesus seven different times says, I am, I am, I am. In fact, we've got them on the screen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am, I am, I am. And all the Jews listening knew exactly who he was talking about. Exodus chapter 3, God appears in a burning bush in front of Moses and gives Moses instructions on how to lead the Israelites. And when Moses says, hey, when I go and tell people what I've heard, who shall I say sent me? And God from inside the bush says, say, I am who I am sent you, God. So when Jesus makes these I am statements, everybody knows that he is claiming to be God and to what only God can do. Now, what I love about this is Jesus says, I am the resurrection, which means you don't have to worry about dying. One of people's greatest fears, what happens when you die? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you never truly die. You just transition into heaven. You're with Jesus forever. But not only that, don't miss this. He says, I'm I'm the life. What is that? That means real life, meaningful life, not just eternal life, but life now is only found in Jesus Christ. John 10, 10, he put it this way. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, and I come that they may have life and have it to the full. What does that mean? That means without Jesus, you can never really experience life. There are so many people, spiritually speaking, that are walking around and breathing, and they don't even realize that they are spiritually dead because they don't have Jesus. How do we know that? Because John put it this way in 1 John. 1 John Chapter 5, and this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So what separates people from those that have life and those that don't have life? Jesus. And you might be thinking here today, and you might be, be watching and thinking, well, Jeremy, I, I don't have Jesus, but I have life. No, you you may be breathing and maybe have a heartbeat, but you're empty inside. Why? Because only Jesus can fill you. Uh, How do I know that? Because there's so many people that think, you know what, if I can just get something, then I'll be satisfied, then I'll be fulfilled. And you get the new house, and it's great for a month, but a month later, you're, you're empty again. 
You get the new car. A couple of weeks, it's awesome. You're empty again. You get the, the new job, the new clothes, the new shoes, the new hat, the new whatever it is. And what you think would satisfy you and fill you leaves you empty. If I could illustrate it, I'd do it with one of these guys. How many of you have ever had a chocolate Easter bunny on Easter? Yes, I got one when I was a kid, and I was like three times as big as this, and I was absolutely amazed. And I remember opening it up, and I ripped that bad boy open, and I'm like, this is going to be the best thing ever. How many of you have, have had one of these before? Yes, now how many of you know what's on the inside? Nothing. It's empty. And I'll never forget as a kid opening this thing up and having it crumble in front of me with utter disappointment, thinking it was filled with chocolate, only to know there's nothing but air in there. I got ripped off. And yet, friends, this is the life of so many people. They got the good-looking gold on the outside. They got everything that maybe this earth could offer, but on the inside they're empty. Why? Because they don't have Jesus. Jesus said, what good does it do if a man has everything this world offers and yet forfeits his soul? Now some of you with OCD are thinking, who's going to pick up the ribbon and the foil after the service? <laughs> Last service, somebody could handle it. During the middle of the message, they came up, grabbed it, and put it away. It'll be okay, all right? <laughs> Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he says to Martha, do you believe this? It's the same question he asks every single one of us. And we're not talking about just some intellectual understanding. He, does, he doesn't ask Mar Mar Martha, hey, Martha, do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Can you comprehend what, what I'm talking about? No, are you willing to bank your life on the statement that I just said? Now, now, what does that look like to go from intellectual and have it drop down to your heart? It means that, hey, I just don't believe that this is a chair. And I don't just believe that it can hold my weight. But I'm actually going to sit on it and let it hold me up. See, there's, this is what separates so many people. A lot of people acknowledge that there's a God. James says in James chapter 2 that even the demons believe that there's a God and they shudder. See, real faith, true faith will always result in action. If I told you guys, say after the service, there's $10 million on the roof somewhere. For some of you, you would not even check out your children from the nursery. <laughs> You've got like your best clothes on. It wouldn't matter. You would scratch up your shoes. You would scratch up your pants. You would figure out to get a way to get up to the roof. Why? Because you would believe that hey, getting that $10 million would change your life. Same with Jesus. When you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, Everything changes. It always results in action. Now, just to be clear, there is not $10 million on the roof, okay? I want to go out outside and have somebody Spider-Man in the wall after the service. Do you believe this? Now, how does, how does she answer this question? This is what she says. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I love this. Let's break that down. Yes, Lord. Lord meaning master authority for every area of my life. I believe in that Greek tense. It's I've always believed and I will continue to believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior, the Savior for my sins, the only one that can save me, the Son of God. In other words, Jesus, you're not just this miracle worker. You are God in the flesh, one of the three persons in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Father. You are the Son who is coming into the world. You are the one that was promised in the Old Testament scriptures, who we were anxiously awaiting and looking for, and you are standing right in front of me. Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Down to verse 32. 
We're going to enter scene three with, with the sister Mary. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, Jesus wept. Pause just for a moment. Here's one of the things that I love about Jesus that never gets old is Jesus will always meet you exactly where you're at. For, for Mary, she's crying. He didn't say, hey, stop your crying, stop your tears. He just cried with her. For Martha, when she had all these questions, he didn't say, hey, quit asking me all those questions. Jesus meets us right where we're at, wherever it is. He sees your pain. Not only does he see your pain, he understands your pain. Why? He experienced pain. You're like, well, I've, I've been betrayed. He was betrayed by Judas, one of his 12 disciples. Well, well, I've had a friend that stabbed me in the back. He's had a friend, Peter, that denied knowing him three times in the most difficult time in his life. Physical pain. He gets it. He was whipped almost to the point of death and crucified. He was on the cross and God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He gets your pain. Which means those times where you're crying and nobody else sees. Not only does Jesus understand it and see it, he meets you exactly where you're at. One of the seasons in my life where I cried the most was 19 years ago. Our oldest son, Jacob, was at Stanford Hospital. He was about three weeks old. I just started the job here. I was driving back and forth. We were staying at the Ronald McDonald house. house. Actually, Kelly was. I was staying here. Crazy season of life. He was in the ICU. We got all this bad news. I didn't know whether he was going to live, whether he was going to die. And I would get to the hospital and I would go to the bathroom, not because I had to go to the bathroom. But I would sit down in the farthest stall and I would cry my heart out. And in those moments, everyone, Jesus met me exactly where I was. He gets our pain. And so if you're overwhelmed today, if you're hurting today, if you feel alone today, God gets that. And when you cry, he cries. When you hurt, he hurts. And I absolutely love that about this story. Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. And then verse 37, it says, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. I love this. The, the new King, or the King's James translation, do you know what it says? He, he stinketh. I love that. He stinketh. Lord, by this time, he stinketh. I'm going to start using that with my kids. Hey, son, put on some deodorant. You stinketh right now. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, laundry that has built up in your laundry room, and you go in there and you haven't done it. It stinketh. You know, I, I was supposed to, uh, I went to a public library the other day, and they had this room closed off because there was an animal, I think, that went in there. It died. They couldn't get the stench out because it stanketh, right? Um, I, I played college basketball at a junior college, and one of the challenges was a lot of the guys, they just didn't take their jerseys home after practice. So they would practice weeks, weeks, sweat profusely, never take their jerseys home. The locker room reeked. In fact, they would hang their jerseys up, and when it was time to get them off the hook the next day, they would be as stiff as a board, and they would go around like stabbing each other with their jerseys. And so my coach ended up starting doing all the laundry because it smelled so bad. But Jesus says, hey, roll away the stone. Martha's like, hey, it's going to smell. And I think about that for a moment because I think there's some things in your life right now that Jesus is asking you to uncover. Their secrets, addictions, deceit, cheating, lying. 
And why you don't listen to Jesus is the same exact concern that Martha had in this story. Jesus, if I do that, there's a possibility for a season it's going to stink. But most of the time when we walk in obedience, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. And so for some of us today, freedom is on the other side of possibly a very stinky situation. And so we see in this story, hey, he's been... uh, Dead for four days, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? I love that word. It's in this passage eight times. Believe, 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 believe. The whole point. So they took the stone away and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He goes on, I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. I love this. Here Jesus is praying out loud. He didn't need to pray out loud. Why was he doing that for the sake of the people? Why did Jesus let Lazarus die for the sake of the people? So that they may believe. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. And the man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. A couple observations. Uh, Number one, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the same way that Jesus rescued Lazarus, he rescued you. What do I mean by that? At one point you were dead. In your trespasses, in your sin, separated from God. And what did God do? He sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to come to you. And what did Jesus do? Jesus called you by name. He rescued you. He made you alive. I love in this story that he calls Lazarus specifically. Why didn't he just say, come out? Because all the dead people would have rose, right? He's got that much power. Lazarus, come out. And then he says, unbind him and let him go. I love this. When he was made alive again, he still had his grave clothes on. And Jesus asked other people to unbind him and take the things off that made him look like a dead person. This is one of the reasons why community and connection, JT talked about earlier, are so important. Because there will be times as you mature and grow in your faith, you need people around you because you've got blind spots in your life. And we need people to unbind us from the chains, the shackles, the things weighing us down that we don't even see. I think sometimes... People think, uh, I don't need Christian community, which I believe is one of the most prideful things to say. But not only do you need others, others need you. And so what are some practical ways to bring this home? Why this miracle matters to you today? Four things. Number one, Jesus can use your story for his glory. You talk about a testimony that Lazarus had, that Mary had, that Martha had. Now, now maybe you're like, well, I I wasn't dead for four days and I didn't come back to life. No, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then if you're not yet, I hope you will become one today. You can tell about the fact that at one time you were spiritually dead and Jesus Christ gave you life. Jesus Christ gave you life. And for a lot of us, our story is birthed out of pain. Why? Because pain gets our attention. I think about physical pain. When we break our legs or something's wrong with our body, pain is a gift. Why? Because it tells us something's wrong. It's God's grace. There's times in my life where I've cried out to Jesus the most, have been in the midst of some kind of emotional, spiritual pain that I'm experiencing in life. And to believe that God can use your story for his glory. And a lot of us, the reality is, like when we planned our life out, when we were in junior high, high school, college, and we look at the way it is now, life is not, it's not turned out the way we thought it would. And I would argue that I'm the poster child for that reality. I thought I'd, you know, get married and have a bunch of kids, and I did. But if somebody would have told me 25, 30 years ago that I'd have a 19-year-old with severe special needs who doesn't walk, talk, or eat through his mouth, I'd have a 17-year-old son, I'd have a 14-year-old girl that I adopted from a family member, 
And then I'd take measures into my own hands to make sure I didn't have any other kids. And wah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I've got a 10-month-old now. I would have said, you're crazy. And yet I look at my story, and God's taught me more through a special needs son who doesn't open his mouth than most people that can talk. I look at this picture of adoption, my daughter, and the fact that as a child of God, we're adopted as sons and daughters into his family. I look at the fact that I've got a 10-month-old, and I'm like, wow, God, you really can still do miracles? God, you've got a plan, you've got a purpose, and one of two things will happen when life doesn't go your way. Life throws you curveballs. When life does not turn out the way you thought it would be, you can complain, you can argue, and be frustrated the rest of your life. Or, like me, you can say, wow, God, I never imagined that life would be this way. But in the, the reality, I'm better off because you've taught me things that you would not be able to teach me in other ways. So I'm so glad that you didn't give me what I wanted. And God, it's not always easy. God, sometimes I'm, I'm tired. God, if I'm honest, sometimes I drink way too much coffee than is healthy for a human being. But I trust you. And I trust you. And ultimately, I know and I believe that you're working for not just my good, but ultimately your glory. Number two, it's never too late with Jesus. It's never too late with Jesus. And for some of you, you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, it's too late for my marriage. It's too late for my kids. They're doing their own thing. It's too late for me to have the career, to be the person that God wants me to be. I love the story of Jesus on the cross, and he's in between two criminals. The very end of his life, what did the criminal say? Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Never too late. It's never too late for God to do the things that only he can do. And for some of us, we've put God in a box and saying, God, I don't believe you can do that. We've given up on God, and yet God's never given up on us. Because here's the reality, point three. Jesus can do the impossible. He still does the impossible. To give you a glimpse of what happens in my office before the weekend services on Saturday. Hang out with JT, our executive pastor, Victor, our worship pastor, James, our communications pastor, some of our other staff, Bjorn, and we pray. And yes, we pray for the worship, the message, the kids' ministry, first impressions. But a lot of our time goes to praying that God would do the things that we can't do. And what can we not do as human beings? We cannot change people's hearts. It's impossible for us to do that. And yet, it seems like every week, God is doing the impossible, changing people's hearts and drawing people to Jesus. He does what only He can do. You know, when I was in Cambodia, it's an awesome trip. It was an unbelievable trip. It was a very difficult trip. So there was one, one night where we went to an area in Cambodia where AIM, Agape International Mish, Missions, wants to do some ministry. And we drove out to see where they would do ministry about 8 o'clock at night. And in a matter of 15 minutes, we saw 80 to 100 gals on the side of the street that were being trafficked just waiting for somebody to come up and want to have sex with them. And it crushed my heart because every one of those gals is somebody's daughter. It made me think, Lord, how does this change? How does transformation happen? And it brought me back to, to Modesto. I felt the Lord prompting my, my heart saying, Jeremy, the, the transformation here is going to happen the same way it's happening in Modesto. It's one person at a time. It's our vision that everyone will know him. 
right out of Luke chapter 15, that Jesus would leave the 99 and go after the one that's lost, speaking of sheep, us being the sheep that doesn't know God, not right with God, not walking with God. And we've seen transformation beginning to change, to take place in our, in our community, one person at a time. How's it going to happen in Cambodia? One girl at a time. One rescue at a time. One person getting arrested at a time. Because God always has and still does the impossible. Don't stop believing that. God's not given up on you. And then number four, Jesus wants you to believe in him. It's the point of the miracle. That's the point of all the miracles. Jesus wants you to, to see and sense and know that Jesus has the authority not just to say the things that only God could say, but he can do the things that only God can do. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said this. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I pray that your response would not just be acknowledging that Jesus is real and true. I pray that your response would be, I believe. And I am anchoring my life in Jesus Christ. And that happens in two ways. Number one, with salvation. Believing that only Jesus can save you. That Jesus Christ went to the cross for your sin in your place. And not only died so that you can be forgiven, he rose from the grave so you can experience resurrected life, eternal life, being right with God. And the question is, do you believe this? Salvation. But the other one is, it's in your situation. Whatever situation you're going through right now, do you believe that God is in control that God is all powerful, that God's got a plan, that God's got a purpose, that he's working for your good, but ultimately for his glory. John said this at the end of his book in chapter 20. Now Jesus made, did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may, what's it say? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's my prayer for every single one of us, is that through believing we would have life in his name. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. God, that when there was no way, no way for us to deal with our sin, no way for us to be right with God in and of ourselves, when there was no way, you, you paved a way. And God, you came to us. You sent your only son, Jesus Christ, for us, in place of us, in spite of us. And so today, God, we want to we want to just choose to believe with all heads bowed, nobody looking around, you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone to forgive you from your sins, to make you right with God. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. It doesn't need to be a long prayer. It doesn't need to be complicated. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he asked Martha the same question he asked each of us. Do you believe this? Do you believe that there's only life in Christ, forgiveness in Christ, eternity with God through Jesus Christ? You may not have all the answers, but you know Jesus is the answer. And your heart today is simply, yes, I believe. And I repent for my sin and I give Jesus total control of my life. If that's you today with all heads bowed, nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and look at me? You say, Jeremy, that's me. Good, I see that hand. See that hand. See that hand. Who else? It's the greatest decision you could ever make. Over there. Over here. Back there. Anyone else? 
yes, I believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and I want to be right with him, because to be right with Jesus is to be right with God. God, we thank you so much for the hands that were raised and the hearts that were changed. For others of us, God, we're in a rough season. We're in the middle of grief, and yet we trust that it's ultimately for your glory. Help us to believe in that. God, we love you. We trust you. And we thank you for being a God worthy of our belief. In your precious name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, we had several people raise their hands. Can we just appreciate what God's doing here in this place? Hey, a couple things before you leave. Uh, Number one, if you raise your hand, tell somebody that you came with, but also tell us. Go to the new to Shelter Cove if you made a decision. Also, if you're newer to Shelter Cove, we'd love to meet you. Lastly, Pastor Chad's going to be here next weekend all the way from Tennessee. Don't miss out next week. God bless you guys. Love you. See you next weekend.